everybody merry christmas happy holidays ho 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 from all of us here this is sam and this is rick and uh i just want to say hello to everybody out there thank you for signing in and joining us i want to remind you that later today 3 p.m pacific we're going to give away the honor defense gun okay we also giving away the dp12 and a bunch of really cool merchandise 
Uh, I just uh, saw somebody there already asking if I shaved my beard. I will do that later today in honor of cancer awareness, but I dyed it green for you first because I lost the poll last week. Uh, so here we are. It's a festive time. Obviously, we're all kind of dressed festively, and uh, we hope you are too, wherever you're watching from. And uh, I guess I can just kind of hand this off to you guys. Uh, Rick has been very kind enough to bring in his personal arsenal here, <laughs> and uh, he's going to get to share that with you guys too. So go ahead, take it away. What? Well, what? if we start at the, at, at, uh, the earliest... And it goes that direction. This is 1954 sheriff's model. I, very iconic. One of the top sheriff's pistols of that time period. It was, everybody had it. And it's still an excellent gun today. Do we have the close-up camera? Uh, Why don't we show it right here? Yeah. Give them a little close-up right here. You can hold it right over here in this, uh, this region. Here, I'll, I can do that for yeah. you. Go ahead yeah. and explain a little bit about this. The Smith & Wesson Model 15, 38 Special. Yeah, right. which is a, uh, uh, a target, which is a, uh, it's much like the Model 10, except as you can see, it has target sights, whereas the Model 10 just has a, uh, you know, just has a low profile front blade and notch sight cut into the top strap of the uh, revolver itself. So the Model 15 has the, uh, as you can see, has the adjustable target sights added to it. And this model also has the, uh, oh, I forget the name, I forget the name of these, the, it's like a grip enhancer. Yeah, the, the grip, uh, the uh, grip enhancer. There's an actual name for it, which escapes me at the moment. The, those used to actually be a very common feature on a lot of revolvers. A lot of people used to add those. There you go. Um, this, although not really historically um, special, it is uh, pre World War II, and it's it's actually very in, very interesting as a break. Pre World War II, ladies and gentlemen. That is amazing. Let's show them that up close. Can you hold it just right up here? We're going to be able to show them yeah. here. I can do that for you. Yeah, here we go. This is, a, this is an H&R um, model 999, uh, nine round, 22 um, long rifle. Uh, target pistol is very, also very popular for its time and also very affordable for its time. You can get it for 36 bucks. 36 bucks? Yes, pre, just before wow. World War II. I love uh, the smell of that. Mm. I, uh, I I have a mm. horrible confession to make. I feel like a real jerk. I was gonna. I have a. I have an H and R revolver of my own, and I was gonna bring it in today. And I was about halfway to work when I realized that I sort of forgot. That and so now I feel like a real. Now I feel like a real so and so. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mine's a little bit. Mine's a little bit newer. My H and R is. Uh, I believe it's. I believe it was made in the 70s. I'd have to track. I'd have to run the serial number to find out for sure. I uh, my dad gave it to me. Uh, it's uh, it's a little bit. It's a wee bit interesting. It's the model 649. If anybody's familiar with that at all, that at all. The cool thing about the 649 is it looks like a. Uh, it looks like a Colt single action. So like it looks like a looks a little bit like a peacemaker. It's got the, you know, it's got the peacemaker grip, mm -hmm. but party piece, it has a couple of party pieces. First is that it's double, it's actually double action. So, uh, you know, just like a, uh, so just like the Colt single action arm, you have to cock the hammer and uh, it's got a pin cylinder. So you, uh, you know, you have, and is a loading a gate. Out? No, no, no okay. pin well, cylinder. Okay. So you have, you have to use a loading gate and everything. But uh, the party, first party piece is that it's actually double action, so you can squeeze it without cocking it or do the uh, you know, cock and shoot thing. The other cool thing is because it does have a pin cylinder, you can remove the one in 22 long rifle and install a second cylinder, which will shoot a uh, 22 mag. I have the H&R of that as well. Yeah. And yeah. it's brand new. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a fairly popular gun. I mean, uh, there are a couple companies that still make something like that. Rough Rider still makes a gun a lot That's like the that. That's uh, uh, Rough Rider makes something like that, except there's a single action, not double action. And that is correct. And uh, Ruger, a couple of theirs, their uh, 22 revolvers, again, all single action. But a couple of their uh, 22s same, uh, have the same thing. I believe they're, they have convertible models. Um, Rick, we have a lot of questions. Okay. Is this, um, are these guns for sale? No. 
<laughs> well, that, that eliminates the rest of the questions. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. eliminates a lot of the other questions that were uh, yeah. being posted right now. Uh, yeah, I think people will really want to get their hands on these guns, but unfortunately, they are not for sale. No, this so, is... So, um, sorry about That's that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, keep okay. going. Let's just keep Next this going. Up, Let's hear what you have for questions as well, yes, everybody. So, um, if you want to know more, let us know what you Ooh, want to know. Colt. Next up is the uh, Colt Detective Special, which is 1927. Mm. This Man. was actually the beginning of the snub nose. Wow. This, yep. this started out as uh, a four, five, and six inch barrel, but one of uh, a guy named Fitz, or Fitz, Fitz Simmons, I believe his name was, he worked for Colt. He made this, the snub nose model, and he actually took out part of the trigger guard too, but that made it for the, de the detectives wow. to carry. That was the whole beginning of that whole thing. And wow. Also, uh, it should also be noted that the original Fit Special, uh, which was one of the early snub noses, the original Fit Special was a little bit different than uh, the awesome. actual, than actual snub nose revolvers in that the Fit Special was actually a uh, was actually a Colt new service that was cut down to a two inch mm -hmm. barrel. Like uh, usually they did not have a, uh, they, did, they did not feature a front sight because the whole point of a Fit Special was you just pulled it out and just pointed it whoever you were going to, whoever you were going to shoot with it and away you went and additionally he would uh he would actually cut away the front of the trigger guard and there were a number of people who were known to carry them the uh, fit specials are uh, they're kind of rare these yes. days and uh they made for, 600 of them yeah 600 is all yep yeah but uh the cool thing about detective specials much like the uh much like the colt cobra that uh that they have reintroduced True. is uh for, they are a slightly larger frame than the Smith & Wesson J, the uh, Smith & Wesson J frames. Yes. And these hold six of 38 Special as opposed to only five, which most snubbies carry. I believe they, they actually, in the time they made this, they actually called this a D frame. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, the Colt D between frame. Between the K and the, and the J. They called it a D. Yeah. As far as size-wise. Yeah. And those Colts are very nice. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I, I think everybody who's like a, anybody who's out there who's kind of into old guns, uh, just about everybody has that, uh, has a, a bit of a, how should I say, it has a lust for a Colt Python. Like, yeah. Yeah, just about oh, every, yeah. like, you know, part of me wants one, even though I irrationally know, wait a minute, <laughs> they're really expensive that, you know, uh, just because we started talking about a Colt Python, someone's Colt Python's timing just went out because they need to be worked on all the time. They're known <laughs> to be very finicky, but like, just because they're so pretty and it's just like a, a thing, like, it just doesn't stop me from kind of wanting one. Anytime you talk about revolvers, the snake guns come out. <laughs> they always yep. do. It's yep. just like... One of the iconic things yeah. that it was just a, a major part of history from when they all those came out at one time, pretty much, and just trying to travel through time, yep. and then kind of disappeared for a while. But as you say, that now some of them are being reintroduced. Yeah, the co they uh, they brought the cobra back. Maybe they'll bring the python back, but I kind of doubt it. But oh well, such is life. <laughs> Grayson, are you following back there um, on any of these comments? By the way, we have Grayson here. We have Tim and Adam back there as well, uh, letting us intrude on their set. Hi, guys. Uh, it's beautiful, hey, guys. right? Isn't our set awesome? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Grayson, if you see some questions that I'm missing. Um, yeah, it's not. It smells like yeah. Taco Bell just in here. Of, just, just kidding. Just a lot of comments yeah. about the green beer today. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Who just was kidding the lead holster maker back in the 40s? Oh, well, that's uh, the lead holster maker back in the 40s. Well, that uh, there probably wasn't really one. The uh, market wasn't quite what it is today, but with that said, there would be a few. Uh, there would be a few front runners. Don Hume would have been a big one. Uh, El Paso Saddlery that would have been a big one. So that was one of the known like big suppliers. Uh, also, uh, I believe they were uh, either Myers or Myrick. Th that was another. Uh, I believe it was uh, Sam Myers. I believe was the name. That was another big one. Those were the like those were the big time saddle makers for a lot of you know for a lot of police departments and so on and so forth. Yeah. But uh, often enough, uh, you know the holster market 
wasn't what it wasn't back then what it is today in any way, shape, or form. Often enough, you would find a uh, you know often enough you'd be, you'd get a holster from uh, from like a saddle from like a saddle company. They would usually yeah. make them, and uh, you know there weren't nearly as many options. You know uh, you know you could kind of get like you know back in the day, what was really popular was whatever you got, which back then most of the time was a revolver and often enough you'd get like a three persons rig or something like that for it and that was and that was pretty much it or uh i know uh in my family they kind of just grabbed what was laying around and kind of devised their own plan and made their own at home holster <laughs> and there was a lot of that too you know uh, i mean granted there was there was more than that you know uh, there uh, believe it or not uh iwb holsters existed even back then i mean you can find uh uh you can find uh holsters for what they called belly guns this back in the day a uh, small revolver like this would have been referred to as a belly gun and the way that worked is that a uh, the primitive IWB holsters well they weren't primitive but the IWB holsters of the day would hook onto the uh, front tabs on most waistband which is what most people would mm -hmm. hook their suspenders on right and uh, it would hook over that and it would sit right in the front of the waistband so believe it or not what we now call appendix carry that's nothing new. Like they were doing that before the car was a thing. Okay, <laughs> yeah. so uh, you know, so uh, it wasn't quite what it was. It wasn't quite what it is today. But there, but uh, there was there was still some stuff going on. Um, by the way, speaking of holsters, did you see my man Rick? You see what holster he has on today, ladies and gentlemen? Yep. We both got it going on right here. <laughs> That's how we roll around here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love the shoulder holster. Yes, so. it's comfortable. It's very comfortable. Uh, so moving on from shoulder holsters. Uh, keep the questions coming. I uh, obviously, I, I can't uh, keep up with all these people or just keep commenting in here, but uh, Merry Christmas to all of you as well. I see a lot of that going on. Um, Oh, actually, somebody just talked about how about the shoulder holster rig. Well, we'll get into that maybe another time. Maybe we'll have a, a segment just on holsters. Would, would you like to know about ours, or do you want to know about shoulder holsters as a, as a whole? Like, because we can get into that. <laughs> so, okay, so shoulder holsters, uh, you know, just like I mentioned with appendix holsters, believe it or not, shoulder, holst shoulder, shoulder holsters have, they, they've kind of been around the block. They're they're uh, they're not necessarily the new. They're not like incredibly new. Th those were around for, you know, those were around for decades and decades. But they weren't generally preferred because you know uh, you know designs weren't perfect and uh, you know it's it it takes some doing to get one that actually becomes comfortable to carry. And you know uh, I'm sure a lot of us have you know have experienced that. Like we bought a you know when we you know first got you know started getting into carrying we thought okay i'll get a shoulder holster mm -hmm. and i'll be like james bond or you know or something <laughs> like that and then we get one and we find out oh wait a second that you know the darn thing flaps around all the yes. time if you're carrying a big gun it's not always necessarily the most comfortable and then next thing you know the shoulder holster goes in the uh, you know goes in a drawer somewhere and you carry a belt holster like everybody else which is kind of the normal progression back in the day shoulder holsters uh for like police and civilians that was, you know, they were very niche items. Like, there were a small group of people that kind of preferred them, mm -hmm. but most people would carry with a belt holster of some sort. There was also a, uh, in, uh, in the service, there was something called a tanker holster, which was kind of a shoulder holster, not necessarily a shoulder holster like ours, because it was usually more of a uh, single loop that would go across the body. So it, an it would anchor either on the right or left. And then it would sit like somewhere usually right around here, just under the sternum. And uh, it was good for you know tank crews, some paratroopers wore them. Yeah, that, I was gonna say paratroopers. Uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But with that said, that was uh, you know that was you know usually just a military application in the you know civilian realm. You know, a small number of police officers carried them, and normally it would go in the it would normally take the progression I mentioned. Somebody would get it try it and then they'd find they didn't like it as much and they'd just get a sensible belt holster like everyone else. What really broke the shoulder holster open, like the reason why it became a lot more popular, well part of it had to do with James Bond, you know, people saw, you know, Sean Connery and, you know, and then Roger Moore and everyone. But what really did it was Miami Vice. So, uh, somehow there was well there was a, a shoulder holster company 
a holster company called Jackass. I'm not making that name up. They were called the Jackass. It was called the Jackass holster. And they created a shoulder, a line of shoulder holsters. And somehow that found its way to Don Johnson when they were starting to make Miami Vice. And so they wrote it into the show that uh, his character, Sonny Crockett, with the you know with the white linen suit with the sleeves rolled up to here, would carry his gun in a uh, in that jackass rig, and which initially was a uh, Bren 10, and then later became a uh, uh, I believe it was a Smith and Wesson 456 or something like that, but one of the big Smith and Wesson nine millimeters. Anyway, uh, eventually they got bought out by Galco, if I remember correctly. That's who makes that design a shoulder holster and thanks to Miami Vice a lot of people got nuts about shoulder holsters and a lot of people also started carrying with one and discovered oh wait I got a big heavy gun hanging right here that kind of hurts my shoulder a little bit you know when you're you know when you're 22 or 23 like that's not a that's not such a big deal but once you uh, but as the ravages of time go on like this thing's giving give me bursitis for those that don't carry a 1911 like Sam they're not as much of a problem Actually, but, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's there, doing it. He's rolling the 1911. If that, that said, if a shoulder holster is well designed, it's not nearly as much of a problem. And our shoulder holster is actually was actually made. Uh, it was actually designed with that sort of thing in mind. Yeah. I have two shoulder rigs in my drawer. Yep. And they stay there. This one, the can't rides perfect. Uh, it's comfortable. And Super comfortable. I do have to Same carry way. two mags in order to balance it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not carrying the other mag right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, there's a question from Scott Butcher wants to know the brown and the black are they made of the exact same materials? Yes, leather. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. the uh, it. Uh, our leather is all sourced from the same company. We're not gonna we're not gonna say who, but uh, our leather is all sourced from the same company. They send us lots of brown and they send us lots of black, and then and we get it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that would be a. It would be kind of interesting to show uh, show it sometime. But I believe we actually have a video on our uh, YouTube channel. Subscribe to Alien Gear Holsters for more. And, actually, uh, we're uh, on YouTube Live right now. For those of you that didn't know, yes, we're on Facebook Live and YouTube Live right now. Yeah, that's right. Any, I believe we have. We actually have a. Uh, I believe we actually have a video about, up about that. It actually Probably. shows some of our leather stock. So we yeah. actually get. Uh, you know, we just get these big pallets of hide, and we actually, and we actually uh, cut it to size, sew it up, everything. Yes. Everything in house, so uh, yeah, it's the same material from the same supplier and everything. Very comfortable. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it, took, it was two years of engineering and design to get this thing to all the movements yeah. and parts of to make it exactly, specifically perfect. Like yeah. moving in so many different ways and adjusting, and it's it. I mean, it's yeah. Try the 30 day test drive and check them it's out. It. But it is worth it. Yeah, definitely. they uh, they had first start. Uh, I got hired in. Uh, I got hired right at the uh, end of 2015, beginning of 2016, and they had already started working on it by then. Like that's how that's how long we took to make make sure it was right. Um, do the, there's Jacob Littrell. I work for a custom 1911 gun shop. We make a lot of different configurations for the 1911s, and y'all don't make a holster that would fit my dream build. Could y'all do a custom one? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, unfortunately, we don't generally do custom. Orders. We don't do custom. Is the shoulder holder adjustable for height, or can you adjust it to ride lower toward your waist? Yes. Yeah, it is. Uh, yes. uh, if you uh, if you notice here, there are uh, adjustable straps both uh, at the uh, top of the holster and also at the bell hook. So you can uh, so it is totally adjustable for height. You can take it up. You can drop it all the way down. Whatever you want. That's uh, that was another big design priority for us was to make sure that it had that adjustability so that more people could get it right. A big uh, so not to get into it, but a big problem uh, uh, with a lot of shoulder holsters out there is that they tend a lot of them are uh, you know they're very sort of high riding and horizontal so the you know gun it's so well oh, they everybody. ride one side so yeah, yeah you're, flagging you're flagging everybody, everybody. and it's <laughs> and it sits right and it sits right underneath your armpit. And a lot of them don't even have a belt hook yeah. to kind of anchor the thing down, so it just flaps around under your arms, and it's there. Like I said, you you get one because you think, "Ooh, I'm going to be Sonny Crockett, I'm going to be James Bond," and then all of a sudden you walk around like this all the time. Yeah, uh, for real, I didn't. I actually didn't think I'd wear a shoulder holster, and then when I tried this shoulder holster, it, it's it's actually 
a pro I would imagine the most comfortable shoulder holster there is. It's it really is. If you watch the video, either go on our uh, website alienkeyholsters.com, click on videos. You can also go to our YouTube and watch them. But the shoulder holster, if you go under holsters, go down to the shoulder holster rig. There's a video there. It's like three minutes. You can see exactly how this thing works. It's a very awesome video. So you might want to check that out if you're interested in the shoulder holster. I see a lot of people here like Timothy Ego um, definitely wants to get a shoulder holster hopefully after Christmas. So yeah. You know what? If you're I'm here at three really... o'clock this afternoon, you could win one. Okay. I noticed that his uh, name is spelled I-G-O and I really just want to ask if it's Ego or I-Go just because of the movie Young Frankenstein, but we're just not going to get into that. <laughs> Wait, can we ask you questions is basically what he's saying. It's I-Go. You guys are asking yeah. us, can we ask you? <laughs> Frankenstein. So. It's Frankenstein. <laughs> yes. Oh man. Uh, so we're, we're still got a few guns here left. Um, do we want to keep going on here? Okay. Uh, next one is actually a uh, Mauser model 1914. Wow. And that's the year it was made. It was produced until uh, 1935. It's a 32 ACP. Um, uh, the barrel is stationary, which is quite different. It doesn't move at all. Easily take, very easy to take down. This was. Uh, Produced in a couple of different, first in 25 ACP, and then they wanted something bigger for World War II, or actually for, for World War I. And so they went into that, and the German police started carrying it, and then it became popular, and then the German military uh, started carrying it, the officers, and then several other company or countries actually started using it, uh, you, the Japanese could get this, uh, officers could get it by special order. Interesting. Yeah. And it was sure. used into World War II, and they, um, it, but like I said, it, was, it stayed, stopped producing it in 35. Wow. This mm -hmm. is excellent to shoot. I, I mean, it's amazing how easy this thing is to shoot and how accurate it is. Look at that grip on there, too. I'm going to show yes. this to these. Yes. Look at this thing. I mean, seriously. Oh, man. You probably don't get to see that very often, honestly. Something that thing that's, is beautiful. Something that's kind of interesting. So this is something I find interesting about a lot of... It, you look at a lot of older guns. So, uh, you know, stuff like, you know, this Mauser or, uh, you know, uh, and a lot of other firearms from that period. Early semi-autos had a much lower bore that's axis awesome. than they do today. Because, uh, so... If you were to, like, if you, you know, look at this Mauser, at just how close to the hand the barrel actually sits, it's much lower than your standard, your mm. standard handgun is today. And that's something that's kind of interesting, is a lot of older semi-autos that, you know, it had that, which, ma would actually, which actually made them more naturally pointing. And, oh man, it is, it is incredible just how comfortable that is. Wow. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. <laughs> I, I can see why. Wow, that's yes. incredible. How did you come by that anyhow? I inherited these three pieces from my grandfather. He collected these. Wow. He carried this one. He was a sheriff in Santa Clara County in California, and he carried this one. And I actually have his belt, his duty belt and, and everything when he was a sheriff there in the 50s. Wow. Yes. These two, um, I, my father said, come get these. I don't know what they are. Uh, figure it out. And so he gave these to me, as, and I went through the history on them. And I don't, still don't know, to this day, know why my grandfather collected these, wow. except that they are historical, especially the last one. Yeah. This one has got a history you wouldn't believe. Well, let's okay. hear about it. This is an FN 1910, 32 <laughs> ACP. It was made in 1910. There was uh, an issue of 235 of them made um, right off the bat for um, the Serbian army. Four of those were sent to radicals 
of the Serbian uh, from uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. Oh, I know where this is going. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of those four was actually there's still debate on whether it was a 32 ACP or a 380. One of those is what killed Archduke Ferdinand. No. Yes. And touched off World War One. And touched touched off World War One, which is actually the first really good uh, case of um, fake news. Because the news blew it completely out of proportion, saying it was something it wasn't. That's what started the World War One. Huh. Yeah. They didn't oh, know exactly what happened, so they made up their own stories, kind of like today. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that yeah. And I gotta see. Also, that thing. Uh, that's another thing that's nothing new. Uh, wow. you, you look up what happened in the uh, uh, Span the Spanish American Check War where we invaded Cuba and the Philippines. It was much the same thing. Uh, you know, William Randolph Hearst and uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, Jupiter Pierce Point, Pierce Point Morgan more or less started that war so they could uh, sell munitions and stuff to the army. You know, what uh, the, I believe the quote was uh, uh, was just yeah, like cool. you. Just go take pictures, I'll create a war, something like that. <laughs> yes. Uh, also tied to this is the uh, assassination of the French president in 1934 and the uh, assassination of the gov governor of Louisiana in 35. Oh, oh King, the Kingfish, or Kingfisher, or it's something, like a, something like that. I, I, oh, his name is it? right here on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. But, Hey, whoever Huey, the governor of, of Louisiana was at that time, find he was out. killed with this pistol. Yeah, Huey something or other. Yeah, uh, yes. If I remember correctly. Huey Long. That Huey Long, right. Yes. Yeah, that, uh, like, I think they called him the Kingfisher or something like that. I don't know. Yes. Uh, so that's yeah. all with that one gun. Yeah. Wow. That's wow. pretty crazy. Yeah. And there was only 200, how many? Two? Well, there was originally 235 made of them, and then it became very popular, and uh, this is actually what saved FN from going down. Wow. Is this pistol. They would have gone under. Rick, here's a question from a oh, Coleman proof. Haynes. Love these proof marks. Those are. And maybe Sam could uh, tell you this too. But if you could take any modern weapon from today back in time, what would you take, and what period of time, and why? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> right there. That's it. That's what I would take back in time. I, I have, I actually carry quite often a Glock 34. Same size as this, twice as much ammo, and it shoots perfectly. This just feels so natural. Can I show? Yes. Yeah. This is the gun yeah. that he would take. Yes. And this is representation of something earlier than this even. Although it's a model 1911, this was actually created in the 1890s. Yeah, the late 1890s. Yes. Uh, John Browning first started uh, first started work on the on the uh, what would eventually become the 19 model 1911 pistol design in uh, 1898, 1899, somewhere yes. right around there. The first one uh, and uh, what he did. And this was a little bit more common back in those days than than uh, than it is today, as far as gun manufacturing go. And essentially, what uh, the way it would work is he created sort of a rolling prototype that would be offered for sale. Now, uh, the eventual idea was to create a gun that he could sell to the army. Initially, it was com offered commercially as the model 19, uh, first as the model 1900, which, if you look at it, uh, it wouldn't it barely looks like a 1911 at all you wouldn't think it was all that recognizable and initially it was actually chambered in 38 acp which pretty much doesn't exist anymore uh the cant was totally different on that yeah on the, grip the, too. the cant was different the safety was different the sights were different the hammer was way different everything uh also it it uh it actually had uh, locking look it actually had locking at both the uh at both the barrel bushing and at the rear of the barrel, as opposed to a, a you know, a dual locking links. Eventually, the design that uh, that he uh, created ha has only a single locking link at the uh, you know at the rear of the barrel, but then the uh, you know, but then the bushing to lock it in place at the slide, and a whole bunch of other improvements got uh, got made. Every few years, he would it, it would uh, be released as a Colt model, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, in eventually, they. Released one in 45 ACP. That was the model 1905, and then as 
you know, as the U.S. military started making suggestions, okay, uh, here's some things we want, uh, he would make changes. They, you know, the hammer got revised, the safety got revised to a, you know, to the thumb safety, and then eventually the cavalry said that they wanted the grip safety installed so that, you know, they didn't have to worry about that so much while in the saddle. And then the design was finalized in 1910, uh, right around the Thompson Lagarde pistol trials, if I remember, if I, if I have right. the name correctly. Right. There was a round of pistol trials conducted. That was the, you know, that was the model that they liked. That's what they picked. And that was in 1910, and then it would, you know, it went into production for the next year. Hence, model 1911 beat out a design by Savage, as well as a, uh, as well as the Luger. Uh, DWM submitted a, uh, you know, submitted a Luger, which, uh, you know, the Luger pistol, which initially was uh, actually created in, uh, in uh, 7.65 uh, 30 caliber, and. Uh, then they bumped it up to nine millimeter. That's the one that the German army bought. But then for our pistol trials, they actually submitted a model in 45. There are a few Lugers in 45 caliber that are floating around and they go for like house money. Like <laughs> there, there are a few of them out there. Like, but like we're talking, an, you can count them on one hand. That's how rare they are, but they are around. Question for you guys, another question for you guys, and we're going to get back to what gun you would take back in time too, but here's a question for you. Um, what is your dream vintage gun? Give yourself some time to think about that if you need to. Do I get, um, can I separate that into rifles and shotgun? Rifle, shotgun, and pistol? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, my dream vintage rifle uh, would actually be a Winchester Model 1895. Hmm. Uh, or, uh, or might not be the 95. I, 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 no, it's the 95. So what was different about the 95? So it's a lever action, but it had an internal box magazine. The way you loaded it was you'd 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 uh, open the breech and then you had to load the bullets in into the box magazine. But it carried five rounds instead of a instead of the tube magazine like every other lever action Winchester rifle and most other uh, Winchester rifles. Savage, of course, had made the ultimate lever action with the Model 99, but those are actually relatively easy to come up with. So, okay. Uh, well, they're, they're somewhat easy. You're not going to find okay. them all the time, but if you go on Gun Broker, you can find one pretty easy. I, I personally, in my own opinion, okay. think that uh, the Marlins are much better made than the Winchester. They probably took some ideas from the Winchester, but they beefed that up so that the Marlin can usually handle much bigger loads. They're just made beefier. Yeah. I own two, and I love them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No so, bias. So, so Scott Butcher asked me which of these guns would I like to have most. I'm probably going to have to go with the FN. That's probably that's pretty sweet. I mean, come on. I mean, I'll, any one of them, but the I'm, other thing about this particular gun is they tried. They were doing something new, which Makarov get a little bit. and um, the uh, one of the Walters actually tried, which is the mainspring goes around the barrel. You notice there's no mainspring underneath it. Oh, so that's kind of like the PPK. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, apparently this shares the shares the design if you look in the front you can see the bezel here that you spin oh yeah that's this the uh show them right here they, yeah. it comes it comes okay. off yeah uh and we'll the spring comes out yeah we'll see if we can uh oh. i happen to know that you don't have to lock his rear to do it oh okay well you can see this bezel here that goes around the uh they actually go that's the end of the. That's yeah. actually the end of the recoil spring. So the recoil spring is actually around the barrel right here, as opposed to underneath it. It is uh, very tight. Yeah, and uh, the Walther PPK and uh, the Makarov and a number of other guns uh, have the actually have the same feature. So if we were to take it down, I'm not going to do it. But uh, if we were to take this down, the slide would come off. The barrel is actually fixed to the frame. No, that's not. not. No, that's. Oh, not. it's not on this one. No, the uh, in this one it's. It's kind of a pain. You take the mainspring out first, and then the barrel actually has like a key. You have to turn it, pull it, turn oh, okay. it, pull it. Wow. It's, oh. And there, inside there's, there's uh, three like um, locking mechanisms that lock it into place. It's wow. amazing. Yeah. But it does kick up just like other uh, 
semi-auto barrels. Oh, okay. So that uh, there you go. That there's a difference. I didn't know that about the model yes. 1910, but that is true about the PPK and a number of other guns. The barrel is actually fixed to the frame. The the barrel doesn't move at all. Yeah. Everything else does. Much but, like this. Yeah. Doesn't move. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to Sam. We're going back to you. If you could take any weapon back in time, what time period would you take? What would you take, and why? What would I take, and why? Uh, and what time period? I would take. Uh, you know, actually, I would just take a standard hunting rifle, and I would. Uh, I would hit the. Uh, I would actually hit the American West. Prior to uh, yeah, buddy. prior to the uh, you know you know prior to colonization yeah and I'd have the I'd have the hunting trip of a lifetime oh buddy that's like my dream Unspo unspoiled uh, back it's, when the American West was completely unspoiled like it's, yeah uh, unspoiled by development and everything else which is a blight on the stunning North American landscape. Uh, the closest thing you can get in America now is Alaska. Uh, yeah. That's true. About as close as it gets to being able to go back in time. I love Alaska. I spent a lot of time up there, and I, I went up there for that purpose. It was it did, did become like the greatest hunting trip of all time, but I spent about 130 days out there in the woods, and it was just like going back in time, hunting and fishing and trapping and just – that's – Definitely, I'm right there with you, Sam. Yeah, that's man. my that's my speed if, right there. If I didn't have a, if I didn't have a wife who would who just would not go a wife and kid that would definitely not go along with me if I uh, it would definitely not go along with me if I had the mind to I would so totally move there. But, oh yeah, <laughs> at least for the summers. Well, yeah. there's really not summer in Alaska, I guess. Hey, yeah. we're about we're about as close as it gets to Alaska right here. So <laughs> you can you come go. on out to Idaho, northern Idaho. Yeah, it's slightly less cold and mosquito and a whole bunch of mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're uh, if you're anywhere north of Arctic Circle, you're done. Mosquitoes, they're like state bird up there, and they are big, and there's lots of them, yeah. right? I think Jim jokes. If he, I don't know if he's on here today, but he's out of Anchorage. Uh, he could uh, vouch for us up there, and any of you that have been to Alaska know. Oh, okay, actually, I see a very interesting, very interesting question from uh, from a Mr. Jim, Mr. Jimmy Wetzler. Opinion on bolt action shotguns? I think they're freaking cool. <laughs> uh, I totally want one. And uh, and yeah, that would, they uh, they certainly make a fine turkey gun. I ran into a. Uh, I found a, a Remington bolt action shotgun. I forget the model number. Uh, ran into it in a uh, in the used rack at a gun shop I was in a month or so ago, and it had a. I think the barrel must have been like 32 inches. It was like a, it was a ten. It was like 32 inch. It was like a 32 inch barrel. This thing was a tank. It was a 10 gauge. Oh yeah, it was yes. like it was like this tall. It, so it's like a you know. Take down airplanes. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Uh, Michael Greer wants to know if Alaska has uh, mosquitoes. Uh, I think that's probably a joke. Uh, yes, they have more than you could imagine as far as mosquitoes. Here's uh, Scott Butcher. I'm going to show you a picture. You asked me my favorite, what my dream hunting rifle would be. It's probably 338 Lapua. Sorry, that's uh, that's a good round. That's kind of what uh, I killed the moose with one of those actually. But there, uh, that was probably my buddy built one, and I've shot it, and it is insane and so i was sold right then and there look can i afford it probably not but uh sh i can dream so todd i think that might be a little bit more affordable than you'd think there are, there are there are a couple of custom uh semi-custom rifle makers that i know of that will uh chamber that will make you a rifle for less than you'd think that will chamber it in just about anything uh er shaw They'll make they'll uh, they'll make you a custom rifle. It's based on the Savage 110 action, which is you know it's solid, it's proven, and uh, you can get into a custom rifle for about you know it's about a thousand, maybe a little more depending on options. I'm pretty sure they offer it in 338 Lapua as well as everything else you can imagine. Then there's uh, Montana Rifle Co Company. Uh, yeah, Montana. They actually make some good guns. Yeah, uh, Montana Rifle. That that's my uh, that's actually my dream hunting rifle is a uh, Montana rifle. Yeah, I really want one, and uh, I have become convinced that uh, my next gun will probably be a seven Remington Magnum, if not a three hundred Magnum. 
but probably the seven Remington Magnum. Mm, and I have uh, one of those. I, I love am, it. I'm really I've been dream drooling mm. over a Montana rifle and seven Magnum for quite some time. Can't maybe go wrong. I'll maybe I'll find out that that's a horrible idea and I should just stick to my thirty out six. But hey, thirty out six is awesome gun yeah it is but i just really want a seven remington magnum i actually yeah. had the 110 seven millimeter magnum and i couldn't hit that wall with it <laughs> got, got rid of it got my marlin 4570 and i've been happy ever since <laughs> there we go <laughs> <laughs> so whatever works for you <laughs> yeah whatever works for you is the ultimate whatever is going to work for you is the ultimate gun to get yeah. um it says mosquitoes kill uh what was it where was this at mosquitoes kill Reindeers um, in Alaska. Well, th here, let me just give you a little knowledge. Reindeer is actually, when you take the caribou and you domesticate it as a, like a horse, that's when they're considered reindeer, but they are a part of the caribou family. The mosquitoes can kill them, and that's actually what creates the migration of the caribou. They actually have to move uh, because they can literally take like over a pint of blood a day. And so they are constantly on the move or they'll find snow patches way up high. They'll rest there, but um, they, their herds are, there's one herd that's uh, over 250, 280,000 solid. And there's caribou for, I mean, it's unbelievable, the herds up there. But uh, the mosquitoes are no joke, for real. That's when you get north in the tundra. Once you hit the uh, Brooks Range, you get north there heading up towards like Prudhoe Bay and north, it's it's nasty. If you stay more southern, not like southern Alaska, but southern like Seward area in the Kenai Peninsula, stay close to the ocean. They're not nearly even close to as bad, but you won't see the caribou like you will up north either. But yeah. uh, Also a uh, tidbit. Tidbits, so, we love uh, tidbits. So in North America, it's a caribou. In Europe, it's a reindeer. Oh, really? Is that what they call yeah. them over there? Yeah, no. Well, I'm in, talking uh, about in North America, in Alaska. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and also the domesticated ones are referred to as reindeer, but uh, there are wild reindeer. They're uh, largely Scandinavia, Russia, the Baltic, you know, like the you know the uh, Nordic countries, and uh, you know uh, that the northern areas of uh, of uh, uh, Europe and uh, extreme north of Asia. But yeah, rain, uh, reindeer are up there. They're in the wild, except uh, there, it's a reindeer. In North America, the wild animal of that, uh, those class of, you know, the, the wild animal of that family is a caribou. Just as so, here, it's a moose in much of Europe. They're actually referred to them as an elk. Interesting. I didn't actually know that. So where does yeah. the uh, reindeer... The, wor the word elk in and of itself actually comes from the Latin word for, uh, Latin word for uh, moose, which is alces. Wow. Okay. So you came to learn something, and you did. Uh, we want to learn something else. They want to know, uh, one, where does the red-nosed reindeer come from? And a mosquito, did it cause the famous red nose on a reindeer? Uh, the red nose, uh, I don't know who invented that, but uh, my, uh, my suspicion is that was a, uh, that Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer was invented by a marketing company in the 1940s. Probably. I'd have to look it up, but that's my suspicion. Oh, anyway. thank you for that, Scott Butcher. There's Probably Scott the C. Vallon. There's Tim Cummings. We have lots of people here today checking us out right. and having a good time. That's but. why a lot of that's why a lot of stuff gets invented is so somebody can sell stuff. That's the reason. Exactly. Why. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, uh, marketing. It yeah. is. It has become marketing. We know Christmas isn't about that. Yeah. Like but. the song "Jingle Bell Rock." I'm not making. I am literally not making. I am not making this up in any way, shape, or form. Okay. That was actually written by a guy. It was actually written by a guy who uh, created corporate jingles for uh, for television. He wrote "Jingle Bell Rock" basically to be a commercial Christmas song. It, it worked. It is. It yeah. is. And it worked. And people, a lot of people hated it back in the day. They, they listened to it like, this is complete and utter drivel. This is crap. And today it's one of the most popular Christmas songs. Oh, maybe. For some people. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't like a lot of Christmas music, but whatever. Red Nose Reindeer happened because of Brandy. <laughs> I love Parker. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Yeah, there you uh, go. Which is actually what you're supposed to do on Christmas. Believe it or not, in the in, in the American colonial period, it was actually legal to celebrate Christmas because Christmas back in those days was actually a just total drunk fest. 
Hey, here's some interesting information. I'm glad you brought this up, Sean Devlin. Uh, this is actually true. I learned this while I was in Alaska. The female mosquito is only the one that bites. And the reason why is because the, the female mosquito takes the blood back to their eggs, which uh, keeps them alive. And so that's why the females are the ones biting you. They also, so you wonder why there's zillions and zillions of mosquitoes in Alaska. Well, the tundra is covered in blueberries. The mosquitoes actually help pollinate the blueberries. So there's a little bit more of information for you. So when you're killing the female mosquitoes, you are probably killing off their young as well. That's all I got to too say. Far, that's, uh, yeah, that's way too far north for bees. And that's normally how everything gets pollinated. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is very, very few bees. So in Alaska also, very few gardens and stuff. Well, the growing season is so small. That's why yeah, the trees are 80 years old and they're about as tall as me. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, there is stuff that grows up there. If you ever want to, uh, if you ever want to just completely freak yourself out, Google Alaska and Google the words Alaska cabbage. And oh, you yeah. Will be, and you will that's be actually insane. Well, that's because they have 24 hours of daylight when there is light. Yeah. they. It's got a short growing season, but it's 24 hours a day of daylight. And so there's a particular uh, hardy breed of cabbage that is, uh, that it, a uh, of cabbage and carrots and other root vegetables that grow up there, and they get massive. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. Hey, Mark uh, Okanansky, that's how I'm gonna pronounce your name from now on, just so you know. Um, you asked, mosquitoes actually have a purpose. That is actually why how I found this out, because I said, why are there so many stupid mosquitoes? There's gotta be a reason for it. Well, they actually pollinate the zillions of blueberries. The blueberries there are like blades of grass around here like it's insane how many blueberries there are uh but that's I, apparently that's why the mosquito exists because it helps a, pollinate it'd be a great place to hunt black bear oh it is oh, man yeah. i shot oh. one with my bow up there and i made some sausage it was some of the best summer sausage i've ever had hands down it came right out of hibernation so it was detoxed it wasn't full of rotten fish and it was so good I'm that's a you. that's a uh, that's a thing so for uh mm. so for all you out there all you uh all you out there you do not Getting a coastal bear is a bad idea because bad. <laughs> things taste like what they eat, and so if you eat, yeah. so if you eat a bear that's been gorging themselves on fish, you're good not in for luck. a good time. <laughs> no, you want them about a week or two when they've come out of hibernation, and in uh, um, you know, fortunately in Alaska, that's in June. Uh, they actually don't even open hunting season until June, so uh, it's they come out way later up north. But you want them when they've come out. They've been asleep and dormant for four months. I don't know how we got onto this topic, yeah. but uh, <laughs> which anyways, Alaska, I could talk for days Alaska. about this. Which is a related note. A lot of people out here don't necessarily like to eat grouse all that much because most of the grouse in this uh, in this in this part of the world feeds on like what they eat the most is usually pine nuts, and so forest grouse will have a, can have a very piney taste. But I like them. But yeah, a lot of but other people don't. But that's okay because if that means you know I. You know, I you know I go out for a day or two grouse hunting, and I come home. I got a few you know grouse breasts. The you know, the wife and anyone else like, oh no, I don't want that stuff. That's fine. More for me. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll have fr I'll have I'll, I'll, I will have all the free range squib uh, squab I can get my hands on. Like, uh, sorry, John Davis. Yes, I killed a defenseless a defenseless bear. But listen, if you uh, knew no, how no, many no no and. And didn't share with the rest of us. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Didn't share because I ran out. But I'm telling you, if you knew how many baby moose these things take down. Yeah, uh, that is uh, a... Uh, that's why moose have two offspring, twins, every time. Because one of them sometimes doesn't make it. Uh, when uh, when a lot of bears come out of hibernation, up in, uh, apparently in Alaska, they go after the baby moose. Here in the, here in the lower 48, when uh, black bears come out of hibernation, one of, the, one of their primary feed sources is usually, uh, is unfortunately, usually uh, newborn, uh, newborn fawn deer and, uh, and newborn calf elk. That's usually one of their, mo mm -hmm. their primary food sources because they need to, you know, kind of, Fatten up, fatten up yep. after uh, you know after. That's why we all do our part on the yeah. predators. Well, oh, that's that's, that's that's like so. This is something that you know sometimes a lot of uh, people who claim to uh, you know be you know uh, like I'm into animal rights. Oh, okay, uh, you're into the rights of animals you see in Disney films. Is what you mean? But uh, 
that's just the truth. <laughs> but uh, you know, a lot of people don't get just how uh, don't get how by human standards how callous nature can be. But it's a mm -hmm. it's just it's a it's a big system, man. Yeah. It's enormous, and we are just a part of it. That's and it. Frankly, we are doing too much to screw up that system for both the rest of us and also for everything else that lives here. But that's just my own rant. You know, so. uh, I know we've gotten way off topic here. If, we if, if this is something that you're curious in, if you want to talk hunting, if you want to talk taking your meat and turning it into food for you, I will do a weekly show. For real. If we can get that going, let me know if that's something yeah. you're interested in. I'll even do a cooking show. I brought in some jerky yesterday, some deer jerky, and everybody here was telling me they would buy it. They will... They would seriously, they were telling me, I will give you meat if you make me jerky like that. I make summer sausage. I'd make a ton of stuff, but I feel freezers full of meat. That's what I love. And if you want to start talking about some hunting and some meat preparation, oh boy, we'll get that going. Yeah. But let's, uh, we're will, almost out of time here. I don't he know. He will also run down the top 10 Matthews bows he's going to buy this week. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's never going to stop giving me crap for that, I can tell you. Um, but look, we're almost out of time. We've got about five minutes left here, so um, I don't know if you guys have any last closing things you want to say um, about these guns. And, and Rick, thank you, first of all, for bringing yeah, these in and sharing Thanks them. Sure Everybody, your, once somebody uh, said this is the best show we've had yet. So um, I, would, I would say if you're looking for a handgun, don't discount the older stuff. Yeah. There's some really good stuff out there that's mm -hmm. been around for a long time. It's proven. It's not nothing against Glocks. No. It's not plastic. Right. That's like I say, I do carry a Glock uh, and it's fine. Yeah. Well, it seems like all the toys these days are turning into plastic. Yes. And not yeah. metal like they used to be when I was a kid. You can yes. tell my grandkids still were playing with them, you know, the great grandkids or whatever. Yeah. But um, I think it's important to, too, Rick or uh, Sam as well. When you buy a gun like this, let's say you're looking at older guns, would you say that the value increases over time? Like, uh, not that you're looking to invest in it as an investment, but... Uh, if you look at these at their retail value, you're looking at maybe 1500 bucks sitting here. Not a lot of retail value. Yeah. You can, you can probably buy this somewhere. This one here I've seen for under 300 bucks. Wow. But it, that's not the value. Right. The value well, is in you, the history. Right. Right. What What has this been through? That's yeah. That's where I. That's why I have these. That's so I it's a personal value. value. Yes. You know, everybody has a different value. Yes. Yeah. Of and, what it means to them. And collecting guns, it can be kind of like collecting cars. Uh, so, like a. So the thing about in, in, any any sort of collector item it doesn't matter what it is it can be guns it can be cars it can be musical instruments okay uh, just because something's necessarily old doesn't necessarily mean it's actually going to be worth anything right. like uh right you know, so if i grab like a so if you find like a, a you know a fender guitar from the 50s or the mm -hmm. holy grail uh, you know like a 58 or 59 les paul those go for a few thousand to a few hundred thousand okay like especially the like you know 59 Les Pauls wait are we talking about guitars right now yeah oh, oh and we got <laughs> oh, alien gear picks nice. there we go I have a uh, get a close up of that Grayson I have a harmony guitar <laughs> from the uh, from the late 50s it's a art it's an arch top acoustic the interesting thing about uh, harmony harmony instruments back then is it's actually a solid top not a laminate that's pretty rare with uh, with arch top instruments now at uh, if I had like an Epiphone or a Gibson made that way from that era, it would be worth, you know, it'd be worth enough to practically buy my own home. But that Harmony, because it's a Harmony, is worth about as much as my shirt. So just because something's old doesn't necessarily mean it's going to necessarily increase in value. Usually it has to be rare or valuable in and of itself first before it can become more valuable with the mm -hmm. onslaught of time. Yep. There you go. Uh, that's all we have for you this week. Uh, we'd have no idea what we're talking about next week, but when we figure that out, we will certainly let you know as well. Um, look, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. I know that we're getting a lot of thanks for doing the show and people commenting and, and really happy to be here, but we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for being here each and every week. And thank you for commenting and engaging and asking questions so we can do this because we enjoy this. We, this these shows are my favorite. 
parts of the week, seriously. So um, we all get to learn certain things. So it doesn't always have to be about guns, okay? We know people tune in because they want to know about guns. And obviously, we talk about a lot of different things, and, and we're having fun up here. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate them coming in. Uh, Rick, thank you for bringing in your sure. personal guns. And and uh, just just fun. We just have fun here, and we're glad that you get to join that with us. So. Um, Sam, Merry Christmas. Rick, Merry Christmas. Thank you guys so much for being here. Merry Christmas. Merry and, Christmas. And uh, to all of you and out a there. Happy New Year. Yes. From yes. Alien right. Gear, we want you to have a very Merry Christmas, safe holidays, Happy New Year. And we will see you next week for the same thing, CCW. And uh, until then, carry safe, carry in comfort, carry on. And also, see you next year. <laughs>